Hey, good evening, everybody. How many are here tonight? <laughs> quite a few of you, quite a few of you. It's, I'm really glad you are. I'm thankful that you're here. It's great to, uh, to see all of you. I'll tell you, are you having fun in life? It's all right to do that, you know. I'm having fun in the ministry. It's fun in the ministry. It's, it's more fun in the ministry at New Hope. And being semi-retired in the ministry is the most fun. I'm really enjoying that. It's a great chapter in life. Thanks for the opportunity to be a part of life and ministry here at New Hope. Uh, I've entitled this three Sunday night sermon series, The One and Only. That title is based on John chapter 1, verse 14, where... Uh, John said, the Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. So in this three-part series, we're talking about the Word of God last Sunday night, the Lamb of God tonight, and the Son of God next Sunday evening. When he was 23 years old, Charles Spurgeon was the most popular preacher on the planet, 23 years old. He was scheduled to speak at the famed Crystal Palace in London. He would speak there to 23,600 plus people without the benefit of microphones and sound booths and overhead projection. The day before his scheduled appearance, he went to the palace to test the acoustics, and he stood behind the pulpit, and he cried in a loud voice, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And unknown to him, there was a workman in one of the galleries who heard those words, and he later said, they came like a message from heaven to his soul. And on the spot, he was smitten with conviction, and he laid down his tools, and he went home, and he found peace with God by beholding the Lamb of God. Last week, I spoke about the Word of God. The Word of God was before the world. The Word of God created the world, and the Word of God came into the world. And tonight, we want to talk about the Lamb of God in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 29. John chapter 1 verse 29 tells us the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now, this man, the author of this gospel that bears his name, John the Apostle, also gave us three short epistles toward the end of our Bible, is truly someone who is special. I mean, he's got an inside track, privy to knowledge that cannot be obtained by philosophers, historians, or scientists, 
Google, or Wikipedia. Knowledge that came not from man, but that came from God, that came by revelation given by the Spirit of God. John the Apostle introduces us to another man also named John. This other John, John the Baptist, also unveils mysteries. The mysteries, the long-awaited mysteries foretold by the prophets. So John the Apostle presents John the Baptist. And now John the Baptist has some presenting of his own. First of all, John tells us about himself. He tells us about himself, about who he is. First of all, he tells us who he is not. People wanted to know who this man was, this strange stranger who came out of the wilderness, preaching his message of repentance and judgment. He was quite a phenomenon. People from Jerusalem and, and all Judea and the whole region, we are told, were coming to hear John preach. They were confessing their sins and being baptized by him in the Jordan River. It was a movement that came out of nowhere. Yes, people wanted to know more about John. They sent the experts the priest and the Levites, to find out, to solve this mystery of who John was. This repentance preacher was old school. He had all the trappings of an Old Testament prophet. In fact, some conjectured that, that he must have been Elijah. Elijah reincarnated. Elijah taken up into heaven by a chariot, now returned for a special mission. And in style, he was very Elijah-like, the way he dressed, the way he preached. So they asked him in verse 21, tell us, strange stranger, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And John was always direct and to the point, and he simply answered, I am not. Finally, in verse 22, they said, well, who are you? What do you say about yourself? Some even thought he might be the Messiah. But he preached about the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, but he made it clear, I am not the Christ. And the strange stranger becomes even stranger. Then who are you? Tell us so we can tell others. And John said in verse 23, I am the voice, the voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. I'm not the Messiah, but get ready for him. I'm not the Messiah, but he is at hand. I'm not the Messiah, but I am here to introduce you to him. He's already among you, but you don't know him. So listen to the voice. It will show you the way. Watch my hand. I'll point him out to you. So John tells us about himself, and then John tells us about Jesus. The next day, John is doing his thing, He's teaching and he's preaching and he's baptizing and he looked up and he saw Jesus coming toward him. And in verse 29, he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I got a little problem with that one. Uh, I, I have to say that the King James Bible just says it better there. It says, John says, Behold the Lamb of God. I don't know why they took our beholds away from us. It's such a meaning-filled word. You can find it almost 1,300 times 
in the King James Bible and a mere half a dozen times in the NIV. So it is, it's a word that's gone by the wayside. It's a word that's been discarded by modern man. But it means set up and take notice. It means attention, headline news here. And frankly, the language of the NIV doesn't sound like John to me. It's just a little too, a little too light in the sandals. Look, everybody, there he is. Mary had a little lamb. Look! That's just not John. John is a behold kind of guy. John was gruff and grisly. John came out of the wilderness. He ate bugs and honey and wore animal skins. Rambo, not Mr. Roberts. Jesus said of John, what did you expect to see? A reed shaken by the wind? A pushover? A compromiser? A promoter of tolerance? A man who would bend under pressure? John is a prophet. He doesn't bend. John deals in truth. He doesn't compromise. John is a voice. And even when they kill him, the voice still speaks, and the voice will still point men to the Lamb of God. And John's voice rushes over the Jordan and thunders off those Judean hills, Behold the Lamb of God! And then the next day, after the next day, in verse 35, John was at the Jordan again, and he saw Jesus passing by. And again, he just couldn't resist. He brought out another one of those beholds. Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, this is quite interesting because up to this point, that hasn't quite been John's message. He's been talking about judgment and fire. He's been calling people names and warning folks to repent because judgment was coming. In fact, John's imagery was that God had already picked up his axe and he was, he was ready to start swinging it. But now he's got this message, a lamb, a lamb. And believe me, those experts, those priests and the Levites, they knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew the Old Testament significance of a lamb. They immediately thought of Abraham and Isaac and that trip of Mount, up Mount Moriah when God told Abraham to take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him. There is a burnt offering. And Abraham and Isaac walked up that mountain and prepared the altar. And Isaac asked his father, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering, and Abraham responds, God himself will provide the lamb, my son. And Abraham loved that boy. He had waited so long for him, but he loved God even more. And he was willing and ready to obey God and sacrifice his son. He was so willing that he took the knife in his hand and held it high above his son ready to plunge it into the, his son's very heart. And he passed the test, and not a second before, and not a second too late, God intervened and provided a ram caught in the thicket, and with hearts filled with gratitude and wonder, father and son took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. The Jews would remember that. The Lamb saved the day. And then they would most certainly remember the, the Passover, an event they celebrated in great deal, detail and with great devotion, the Passover, when God declared death would strike Egypt as never before. And He gave orders to His enslaved people, 
to take a lamb, a lamb for each family. He said, have roast lamb for your meal and take some of its blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames. And when I, when I see the blood, I will pass over you in your household. And now John stands on the bank of the Jordan crying out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if he hasn't just said the most amazing thing any man has ever said, as he has Jesus in his sights, he adds wonder to wonder. Look what he says. I, I shared this last week, but it, I'm so blessed by it, I, I want to make sure that you're blessed by it as well. Look what he says in verse 30 about Jesus. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me. You see, Jesus was born six months after John the Baptist. So he comes after me, but then John says, but he has surpassed me. He's greater than I am. I am just the messenger. He's the message. I must decrease. He must increase. I am not worthy to tie or untie his sandals. So he came after me, but he's greater than me, and he was before me. He came after me, but he is before me. In fact, he was before us all. He was before Abraham. He was in the beginning. John's got a lot to say about the Messiah, and he will say it without compromise. So John tells us about himself. John tells us about Jesus. But then thirdly, John gives us incredible revelation and insight about the world. You see, he says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's talk about the world. The world has a problem. It's a big problem. It's a sin problem. And the world doesn't want to hear about that, and that's part of the problem. And when they hear the problem, they will do anything to explain it away. They will try to replace their problem with a less offensive-sounding problem. I can't tell you how many people over the years have told me in their evaluation of humanity, our problem is simply this, we, need, we just need more education. I've been told that so many times I've lost count. But a lack of education is not our problem. I'm all for education. I believe in it. I love it. But education doesn't change a man's heart. And education without a change of the heart just gets you smarter criminals. It just gets you more astute and accomplished thieves and better informed sinners. How interesting and revealing, I think, that God chose a man out of the wilderness to so succinctly and accurately reveal what's wrong with the world, sin. God uses the weak to confound the mighty and the foolish to confound the wise. Now, when you tell the world it has a sin problem, they tell you, well, that is just too simplistic. In fact, the simplicity of it hurts their pride. But not just the simplicity of it, the accuracy of it gets under their skin as well. No one likes to be told you are a sinner, but you are a sinner. We're all sinners. None of us have escaped the inherited fallen nature. The Bible says that, that all have sinned. You know what that word all means? Man, I've studied it. I've analyzed it. I've looked it up in the Hebrew and the Greek. I've resorted to commentators and scholars, and they all conclude the word all means all. That's exactly what it means. All of sin. 
come short of the glory of God. All is 100%, not 99. We're just like our daddy, Adam. John says he takes away the sin of the world. The sin. Have you noticed that word? Isn't it interesting that John says Jesus takes away the sin of the world, not the sins of the world? It is not man's sins that keep him out of heaven. It's his one sin, the one sin from which all the other sins flow. It's his separation from God. It's not his acts of sin, it's his state, his condition of sin that God addresses. Man sins because he is a sinner. Man's evil thoughts and evil words and evil deeds come from man's evil heart. Now we've gotten to the heart of the matter. The Bible uses so many revealing words to describe man's sinful condition. I'm sorry, but they pile up very quickly, one on top of another, and none of them are pretty. The Bible says we're blind, we're lost, we're alienated, we're hopeless, we're condemned, we live in darkness, we live in death. Man's sin is his separation from God just the way he wants it because he is a rebel against God. So while there are many revealing words about our sinful condition, there are also many revealing words and phrases in the New Testament that speak of the way Jesus handles our sin. And here John simply says, he takes away the sin of the world. Jesus knows how to deal with sin. The world's got a sin problem, but it doesn't know how to deal with it. In fact, it can't. It's helpless against it. But Jesus has never met a sin he cannot take away. He's never met a sinner he cannot forgive and change. His grace is enough to cover the sin of the world. You can't go any wider than that. You can't go any deeper than that. So was John not saying a mouthful? In fact, was he not saying a Bible full when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm so glad he took my sins away. I'm so glad that he washed them as white as snow. I'm so glad that he removed them as far as the east is from the west. I'm so glad that I know the peace and the joy of the fact there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not call unclean what God has called clean. There's only one who has been able to look into the fallen sinner's eye and say, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Only one, the one and only. Behold the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news in the good news. The good news that initiates the gospel, that presents itself on the horizon when Jesus is pointed out, identified as the one and only, the Word of God, the Lamb of God the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here tonight that's never experienced that incredible joy 
and reassurance and hope that tonight it will dawn upon them there will be a personal revelation there will be initiative on their part to open the heart God has already touched to open their heart to receive all that you promise us and I pray for every believer here tonight that when the enemy would come and attack and accuse that they would do what John the Baptist did that they will point that voice of accusation to the voice that presented and announced the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world that the revelation of the Lamb of God will trump any accusation the enemy would bring any condemnation he would hurl in our direction oh God I pray that all of us would live in that peace in that joy and that blessed assurance